Coming up on this week in computer hardware, iPhone XS, it's coming, people. EFA 2018 updates from Intel, Dell, Lenovo, and some odd things from Asus. Ryan shares his thoughts on the NVIDIA RTX updates and more. It's all coming up next on Twitch. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twitch. This is Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, episode 481, recorded on August 30th, 2018. Intel CPUs and lots of laptops from IFA 2018. Welcome to Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, Twitch's weekly show that aims to bring you the most useful, most delightful, most engaging, most affordable, most expensive, and occasionally the weirdest hardware reviews and news. We love desktops, mobile, servers. Occasionally, we love the mobile the Internet of Things still pisses us off on a regular basis, but that's a security thing, not because we don't like the idea of hitting a button, having everything in our house move simultaneously without us having to further interact with it. But I digress. My name is Patrick Norton. Joining Mr. Ryan Shrout of PCPer.com to make you today's edition of This Week in Computer Hardware. Ryan, are you just terrified at this point? Are, are you even remotely kind of used to being in the Eastern Standard Time Zone, or are you still somewhere in Europe or Asia at this point? No, I'm good. I'm good. Uh, I I live outside of all time zones now. So <laughs> you are I just, beyond I, time you know, zones. Oh, yeah. I've, I've gone past that portion of human existence uh, <laughs> into a world where I only live in artificially lit uh, areas so that I can control uh, my... Uh, is it circadian rhythm as I see fit? Or lack yeah. thereof. <laughs> right. <laughs> True. Or the complete lack of circadian rhythms, those natural ebb and flow of the human or animal that takes us from productive daytime activities through nighttime sleeping. Uh, well, you okay, so we should point out you were, of course, at IFA. Uh, to see the beautiful new ray tracing cards. Uh, you were not here for last episode. We talked about that a little bit. Are there any thoughts, any extemporaneous thoughts you'd like to share on uh, ray tracing RTX cards, how long it will or will not take ray tracing to become common in video games? If Is this the future? Is this going to split the AMD GT, or I should say the AMD and, and, and NVIDIA GPU markets? I mean, how did you feel after several days of being uh, gently exposed to NVIDIA's vision of the future of gaming graphics? Um, no, I don't think it's gonna. I don't think it's going to create this rift between uh, AMD and NVIDIA GPUs. I mean, all the stuff that they showed and they've talked about and the developers have talked about is additive to the experience, right? Okay. It's additional visuals and effects. Uh, it is an option in the game settings in Battlefield. It's an option in the game settings in uh, Rise of the Tomb Raider to to add these effects. So, no, I, I think I think eventually, you know, probably in the next four or five years, we may get to places where, you know, ray tracing is the default and maybe we start to see some game engines or rendering engines that are ray tracing only. They don't have a rasterization fallback, in which case, uh, you know, then you would kind of split the market there. But I think by that point, everybody will have, have caught on, right? Like I fully expect AMD to have ray tracing acceleration in a GPU in the future, I just don't know when it's going to be. The fact that Microsoft created DirectX ray tracing tells you that this is not, it's not an NVIDIA GameWorks feature. It's not uh, something that, that's going to be dead in, in six months or 12 months or something like that. Mm -hmm. It is going to be around for a long time. And, uh, you know, it has, it's always been the, the, the holy grail of graphics rendering. And I, and I will fully admit that some people have said, oh, we figured it out several times previously, um, whether you go back to, you know, separate companies that were created that did ray tracing acceleration and all this. Um, Caustic is a company that came right. comes to mind, I believe is sold to imagination technologies. Uh, but no, I, I, I came I came away from it fairly impressed. I think, you know, the the Battlefield 5 demo, the way they did it was was pretty awesome. I mm -hmm. will admit that when you're playing the game in fast action in real time, that the type of stuff that they showed is is harder to see. 
Uh, right. It's it's not it's not that it's not there. It's just you you know you're paying attention to different things at that point. Um, but that's that's where it will that's where it will all go. Now the question will be when the RTX cards launch, what is their standard gaming performance like? Because the RTX games are going to be a little bit behind. There's only going to be a handful of them, and you know the the value of that will be mitigated because of it. Even though that's what they mm -hmm. all focused on during the during the public demonstrations of the event there was, and stuff. I mean, there was but. an alarming lack. Traditionally, there's there's an NVIDIA GPU launch, and it's like, compared to the previous generation, it's 200,000% more better pick. You know what I mean? Like, they spend a lot of time showing you, like, you know. I guess I would normally expect, if ray tracing wasn't such the feature, you would normally expect them to be like, this is the NVIDIA 1080, and then, you know, this is the NVIDIA 2080 with this giant gap in between them showing the super awesomeness of the 2080. And they did show some uh, some some benchmarks um, in, like, you know, depending on whether, like, DLSS, and I don't even know how you calculate, like, you know, anti-aliasing performance uh, with the new features and the tensor cores and the AI predictivity, some of which only really applies to stills, uh, other which applies to the games. But part of me is like, okay, so I can... I got ray tracing if I have games with ray tracing. I may have a 50% performance improvement over a 2080 or a 2080 Ti, depending on which benchmarks I'm looking at, or some of the benchmarks that have been leaked, possibly legit, possibly faux, suggest that there's not as big a delta between them. Um, if I've got, you know, if I'm if I want to be able to run with anti-aliasing, then I have a huge delta in performance where the 2080 is is pretty amazing, especially compared to even the, the 1080 Ti. Did you get any feel after your 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 sojourn in Germany, uh, or is it just at this point you're patiently waiting for actual cards to ship? I mean, with it's your mostly that. Benchmarks? It's mostly right. that. A A A Nvidia let us release one bit of information about uh, standard gaming performance, but it was the it included HDR gaming as opposed to not, and and that left a little bit of a question mark in our head because HDR gaming had recently been accused of being a bigger impact on Pascal on Nvidia cards, current Nvidia cards, than it was on Vega cards from AMD, which would maybe say maybe they fixed that and they improved that and somehow in Turing and, and that's making up for some of the difference. So it is, it is pretty much a wait and see at this point. I know that there are a lot, there's a lot of, a lot of debate I would say out there about should you be buying these cards now before reviews come out or should you be pre-ordering them? And I, and I, and I still say, no, I, I don't think pre-orders are the right idea. I do think if you don't pre-order them, they'll probably be hard to find for the first little bit of time. Um, mm -hmm. just based on talking to board vendors and stuff, uh, you know, you know, if you want to be that kind of consumer, you can look up, Hey, what are the return windows? I think new egg, at least they did during the peak of the mining boom had things like you can't return products, right. uh, graphics cards. So keep, you know, keep that in mind. If that's your plan, that that may not work out the best, but no, I think mm -hmm. we're very much in a, in a wait and see, um, what do they start shipping on the 20th, I guess of September. Right. So we've got three weeks. Before we know, maybe. Hmm. It seems like forever, I'm, but it's not that long. It's not that long. I, I just, you know, it, it's it's funny because right, everybody's going to be trying to. Uh, I mean, it, you know, uh, it's it's kind of like the 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 case of. Uh, Google Pixel 3s that fell off of the back of the truck in the Ukraine. I think everybody's going to be fighting really hard to sort of, you know, release the scoop on performance uh, on an unfinished graphics card that is not shipped yet. Um, I got to say, I'm I'm really curious to see what it's going to be performance-wise. Um, you know, it's... I'm really curious. Uh, I, in the meantime, I'm really delighted by the the trend on pricing on 1080 Ti's, 1080s, 1070s, and 1060s, which I think is going to continue to drop until supply runs out. Um, the uh, one of the stories that came out, I want to say Forbes is talking about this, was suggesting that you know, unless you have all the money or are a developer or just you know don't care. Um, you should wait until 2019 because they expected like these these parts are this is like an 18.9 billion transistor part, possibly the second largest uh, chip in the world since there's lots of chips we don't know about. But as far as Nvidia knew, like it was the second largest chip being manufactured. They manufactured the biggest one, 18.9 billion transistor count, 12 nanometer process. 
and there were some suggestions um, in this Forbes article that said it would be going to a seven nanometer process. So, you know, we're starting with the founder's edition, which has the pre-launch price, which is the highest the parts will be. They're only coming, well, they're primarily coming from NVIDIA. Um, you know, we've got additional founder's edition parts coming. You've got the actual released parts, which hopefully will be before Christmas, which will be at a, a possibly significant price reduction based on previous launches uh, compared to the founder's edition, like the regular 2080, 2080 Ti, 2070, um, which will be overclockable, much like the founder's edition, 2080 Ti, 2080, and 2070. But uh, yep. the, the, the suggestion was like, okay, so... The, you got the Founders Edition, which is the highest price. You've got you know the non-NVIDIA kind of early release stuff. You've got the actual normal chip release stuff. And then he was saying like, you know, in 2019, I fully expect them to take this processor to a seven nanometer process. You know, seven nanometer, ten nanometer. Either way, it should be more powerful, uh, or or you know, deliver more computing power at less power, and probably a price reduction. Or is that just all ludicrous? to even assume at this point. I think that's pretty crazy. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, I will say, hey, if you're looking to buy 1080 Ti, start looking now. Maybe we've got people in the office that have started to down that process too. So, you know, you never know. <laughs> Not that I'm trying to dissuade you from buying the new products, just, you know. It's a good time to be buying a 1080. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and we'll probably, honestly, it will probably only get better, right? Right. You know, because you know, unless things if the twenty eighty and twenty eighty Ti turn out to be real stinkers for some reason, uh, it may bolster the ten series market for a little right. while longer. But I don't, I don't really see that happening. I mean, a twenty eighty. So the the first return on Amazon Prime, and traditionally we've seen more of the better deals on a, on Newegg for GPUs, but I'm looking at a Gigabyte GeForce GTX 1080 uh, for four hundred and forty seven dollars. Um, technically, it's a pre order. It's it's in stock on September fourth. Uh, an Asus GeForce GTX 1080 five hundred and twenty four dollars. So I, you know, it's like we are below the MSRP again. It looks like whoa. Yep. MSI Gaming GeForce GTX 1080, $499. Um, $469.99 for a Zotac. This is... Uh, I, I, I has the feels that the prices have dropped through the floor and are going to kind of continue to free fall for a while. Um, cool, cool, cool. Yeah. <laughs> Cry me a river, says Ryan Shrout of PCPer.com. Yeah, and 1060s are kind of adorably cheap at this point. Um, so let's talk about uh, out of out of nowhere, apropos of nothing. Um, one of the things I was I was laughing, sorry, the uh, I was I was talking to a, a monitor manufacturer um, uh, uh, earlier today and they they had announced yet another set of, of free sync gaming, uh, gaming monitors. And I'm like, okay. I'm going to have to see if I can borrow a, a, an AMD card because I don't have any AMD cards fast enough to really challenge the frame rates on this monitor at this resolution to do an AMD FreeSync test. Are you ever going right. to do a G-Sync test or a G offer a G-Sync monitor? And I'm heartily anticipating the, you know, we don't want to pay to put G-Sync in a monitor. Ergo, we don't have G-Sync in these monitors. Um but I was laughing because I was reading this order. I got very excited for several minutes earlier this week when I looked at AMD FreeSync working with NVIDIA GPUs, some strings attached. And those strings, I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to like steal the thunder here. But are we talking about the strings being latency issues? Because the idea of having all of these FreeSync monitors and being able to run on, uh, you know, GTX uh, cards or, or G-Sync cards, GTX cards on FreeSync monitors is super exciting. Um, mm -hmm. What's the real world story here? Because it does work. It does kinda. work. The problem is you have to have a secondary graphic system to get it to work. You have to have a Radeon uh, card in the, or not a card. Well, so let's say it this way. Right now, Windows 10 as of 1803, supports uh, a kind of a hybrid GPU setup so that when you right-click on an application, you can say, I want to run it on the low power or the high-performance graphics system, 
right? And that's built into the operating system now. It's not just on mobile. It's not just Optimus. It's none of you know all these things that used to be in the past. It's now a built-in part of of Windows. So that's kind of the key here. And what happens is, is if you have uh, in the setup that Ken did, if you have an AMD APU that has you know a quad-core processor and integrated Ryzen Vega or uh, integrated Vega graphics, and then you install ten you know GeForce GTX 1080. It will let you do, uh, it will let you pick which product you want to render it on. And if you have your display connected to the integrated graphics, mm -hmm. you can still enable FreeSync. So essentially, all the rendering, all the game uh, actions happening on the graphics card, it passes the frame buffer through to the integrated graphics frame buffer and then out in a FreeSync enabled environment. And you can kind of see there in the task manager in the upper right-hand corner of that, you can see the copy operations happening it's a lot going on. It does the 3D render. It does the copy. That's how that's how this is working. So, in theory, this could work if you had an NVIDIA graphics card and an AMD graphics card installed. You know, mm -hmm. a discrete system even. Uh, but right now, the operating system by default doesn't see one as high performance and one as low power or or what have you. Uh, and until we figure out what that workaround is, whether it be a registry issue or an OS configuration issue, um, you're kind of limited to having integrated graphics. The other thing that would be cool mm -hmm. is if, you know, more significantly more people have AMD or Intel-based enthusiast systems like this. If you had a Kaby Lake processor, an 8700K or something like that that, had that, that has integrated graphics, if Intel would support the... Um, you know, adaptive sync technology, not really the free sync branded one, obviously, but just the ability to do variable refresh through adaptive sync. You could do this in theory, do the same thing, right? You could have the display hooked up to the to the motherboard uh, and then pass that through your higher performance graphics card um, all the same, right? So then you'd get the same right. same capability. And, you know, Ken and Allen did all this testing. They have a lot of experience with all of our variable refresh testing from GeForce to FreeSync and beyond. It was absolutely working. It was functional. We did some testing. They even went as far as to do latency testing, right? Because you are doing that file copy, uh, the the image copy across PCI mm -hmm. Express into the frame buffer uh, of the integrated graphics. You can see that there is a small increase in average latency. It goes from 29 milliseconds to 31 milliseconds. And that's whole... That's whole pipe, right? That's from button right. click to photon coming off the screen, tested with an Arduino and high speed camera and whatnot. So uh, that's that's pretty good. There's a little bit of ad latency there. Maybe you round it up to three milliseconds, but uh, not not a whole lot. And um, that's I, I think that's pretty impressive. There's a lot of questions about uh, will Nvidia disable this in a in a future driver because they're not happy about this workaround that happens and. I think if they can, they they will probably. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's also possible that because this is a function of Windows supporting, you know, multiple GPUs from different vendors in this way, that they may not be able to and still, you know, pass Wickle certification or whatever. So this may be a little bit of a NVIDIA versus Microsoft fight about who gets to push their weight around a little bit more um, or who's willing to sacrifice more. To, to, to make whatever they want happen. This, to me, is kind of interesting in that for the, there have been a lot of enthusiasts that have asked in, you know, for NVIDIA to support these adaptive sync monitors. Obviously, NVIDIA doesn't want to support anything called FreeSync because it's an AMD brand. Um, but this is kind of a nice... If NVIDIA is smart, they just kind of leave this alone. They never really mention it. And for the hardcore enthusiasts that pay attention to this stuff, it's like a little nod right it's a little gift to them uh whereas if they fight back against this and and figure out a way to block it and do all that it's just going to be another pr thing for them to have to shuffle through yeah it, it, it would be nice for them to not go out of their way to try to crush this um uh, you know, I, I don't, I, I maybe, maybe, maybe they're distracting enough that they won't crush it. Maybe they'll not crush it out of the goodness of their hearts. But I think the sort of standard NVIDIA response would probably be to crush it like a narc at a biker rally. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know. Yeah. Not wrong. But, you know, it is what it is. Um, in other workarounds, well, not really a workaround, in other alternatives, um, uh, Alan got pretty in-depth on uh, StoreMI. And does StoreMI bring AMD on par with Intel's Optane memory caching? And this I was kind of really curious about. Actually, I apologize. Uh, Alan didn't write this. You write that. As soon as I see storage, I automatically think Alan. 
Um, but, uh, you know, he was looking at, Alan was looking at the NVMe raid performance. Um, you know, what were you thinking as you looked at this? I mean, it seems like Optane's kind of the future for a lot of Intel products, at least for this remainder of this year and some chunk of next year. Um, how do you feel about what's going on with store MI on, on the, the, the kind of the second generation, uh, AMD products or processors? Um, it's a really interesting, it's, it's, it's a really interesting debate, right? So store MI and Optane caching are, are fairly different in a couple of key ways. Store MI is technically not a cache. It's technically a tiered storage system, meaning that uh, it takes slower. You can actually, if you get the full version from Inmodis, Fuse Drive is what mm -hmm. the what the the non AMD branded version of it is called. You can actually have you know three or four different levels tiers of of performance, right? You can have hard drive to SATA to a you know a SATA SSD to an NVMe SSD to uh, memory, you know, system memory cache. Right. And um, the store MI uses that only two tiers, right? So it's traditionally you think of it as a hard drive and then an SSD of some kind. It's tiered also in that the it's it's more like a RAID 0 or a JBOD configuration. If you have a 250 gig SSD and a four terabyte drive, you have 4.25 gigs of storage as opposed to four, right? It's It's additive in that way. It also means if one of those drives dies, you lose everything on it. So you need to have the same backup system and mentality right. as you would if you had a RAID 0, right? Optane caching is is a pure caching play. It is, you know, if the uh, uh, if the Optane module dies, the hard drive's still there and it's fine, right? Uh, and mm -hmm. it doesn't it doesn't affect data integrity that way. If the hard drive dies, obviously the, the, the data's gone. It's not going to be, all be stored on that Optane drive. Sure. Um, so there, there's some differences there. There's differences in how it's set up and how you decompose it if you if you decide you want to revert away from it. Um, but the idea is that for both of them is you want your slow storage to appear faster without having to worry about the capacity constraints of an SSD. And AMD, for their part, what they wanted to do was they wanted to be able to have a solution to match what Intel had, because Intel's Intel storage division gives them a pretty big advantage in some areas, in both the enthusiast community, the consumer community, the OEM community, and they just wanted to be able to have something to say, hey, look, we can do that as well without spending the millions and millions of dollars of research and R and D to do something internally. So they partnered with, partnered with this uh, company called Inmodis to do Store MI. One interesting thing um, that AMD was brought up to us that I hadn't really considered before, and I think is, a, is actually a fair argument, is this pricing advantage that they that they have too. Mm -hmm. It if you're an enthusiast, the assumption being that if you're building a new system today, you're going to buy your motherboard, your processor, your RAM, whatever. You're going to buy an SSD and a hard drive. You know, some two, we you know, 120 to 500 gig SSD and a four terabyte to 12 terabyte hard drive for your large race, uh, you know, larger stuff. Uh, sure. And I and I think that's a pretty fair assumption. Obviously, it's not 100% coverage, but I think for the vast majority of people, that's probably true. You're not going to buy a four terabyte, two terabyte SSD. You'll buy something smaller. You know, separate your OS from your storage, your prime mass storage. If that's the case, if you if you agree with that assumption, then store MI works with those components in place, right? You you combine your SSD and your hard drive, you have an accelerated uh, device at that point. If you want to accelerate your hard drive with the Intel platform, you have to buy an Optane module, right? which is either going to be sixty bucks or so for the thirty-two gig module, or one hundred and fifty bucks, one hundred twenty bucks for uh, mm -hmm. the sixty-four gig module. So there is a, a cost advantage here. All else being equal, if your processors and motherboards and memory are all the same, the same price. It's kind of an interesting direction I hadn't really thought of. And then when you look at the performance, it's kind of, you know, it's the the summary of performance is this. Store MI accelerates things in almost the exact same way as Optane does for hard drives. It doesn't make up for any areas where the performance delta of Ryzen is less than, you know, the Core i7 parts, you know, the PC Mark 10 or Sysmark where the Intel processors already had an advantage, uh, that advantage still exists. And if anything, maybe the, the store MI improves percentage wise a little bit more, but not enough to catch up with what Optane caching, caching does. Um, so 
But, you know, if you go to look at like uh, GTA 5 story mode launch, for example, like the thing that that most people who are listening to this podcast are buying, you know, rise and builds that, that what they'll care about. Like, why do I want about what do I want caching for? It's for things like this, right? You want to accelerate stuff that would normally be slow. If you store a bunch of your Steam games on a hard drive, now you can do it this way. So an Optane that goes from 48 seconds to 26 seconds to load up GTA 5. And on uh, uh, on the AMD 2700K platform with Storm I, it goes from 49 seconds to 28 seconds. So very similar gains, very similar starting points. Um, and, it, and it basically accomplishes the goals out for it. I still think like the UI for Storm I is pretty bad. It needs a lot of work. The If you want to turn off Optane caching for some reason and you want to sell that drive or put it in another system, you basically just... Flip a switch, reboot the machine, and it's done. If you want to do that to a, uh, a store MI system, it's more complicated. It leaves the, it doesn't put the drives back to their exact original configuration. It may not be possible to do that because of, you know, you start out with no data. You suddenly have ten, you know, two, three, four terabytes of data. You obviously can't put all that onto your SSD, so it has a different problem to solve, which is is difficult. Um, but I, I do think they were AMD is basically able to get relative performance and capability matching with what Intel's platforms are with with Store MI, and they did it relatively quickly. And they did it without, you know, it's free. Uh, you can pay for like an upgraded version that will let you, I think, use up to like a two terabyte SSD for caching or something like that, but not really necessary for I think the vast majority of people. What do you think about? Store MI and and either the cost advantage or what the performance differences may look like. Man, I've been looking at uh, you know Alan was really excited about the 660P and you know I was I was on uh, I was I was demonstrating the Camelizer right which is the Camel 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 plugin for uh, uh, the Chrome extension that that runs Camel Camel Camel. And I'll pull it up again, but I was kind of shocked and amazed um, looking at Samsung 850 SSDs because, okay, here we are, like a 500 gigabyte SSD is $99, a one terabyte SSD is selling for, yeah, 197 I think it was like $180 yesterday. And it feels like, you know, all of these fascinating caching technologies are showing up just as the price of SSDs starts making a radical detour towards Shroud's optimal SSD pricing. Um, <laughs> PM, uh, you know, that, that, that mythical 10 cents a gigabyte, that, that hundred dollar one terabyte drive. And all of a sudden there are some really high quality, uh, you know, $200, uh, S you know, SATA base drives. Um, the NVMe drives are a little bit more expensive, but nobody's putting an NVMe drive in, Something you would use for, you know, Optane or, uh, uh, you know, or Store MI. I mean, I, I feel like there's this interesting. I I keep looking at configurations on laptops and desktops, and it's this odd mixture of, you know, pure SSD and playing around with, you know, uh, not so much Store MI. I haven't seen much of, but either Optane or some kind of caching uh, SSD slash uh, hard drive combination, depending on the manufacturer. <sighs> And I'm really kind of curious to see where this ends up in a year, um, because if I, I feel like this is a stopgap until SSD prices finish dropping through the floor, does that make sense? Um, you know, I'd, yeah. I'd, I, you know. Yeah, uh, don't get me wrong. I think what, what we really want is a four terabyte SSD that's cost effective and you know, right. to worry about long, you know, hard drive storage, except for that network attached device for mm -hmm. you know. The mass, mass stuff, right? Uh, videos I mean, and a, pictures a, and backups and whatnot. A four terabyte SSD is still like nine hundred dollars, um, <laughs> you know. In a, in a two terabyte SSD, yeah. you know, it, it scales, right? But um, yeah, I, I, it's you know, I think this is gonna, I think this is gonna be at the low end. I think it's gonna show up on some mid price machines. I'm really curious to kind of see what some of the mid price machines end up with, but it, I don't. I like the idea, but I feel like it's one of those things where when it finally shipped, the problem it was solving was about to not be a problem anymore. Does that make sense? Um, yeah. Or, or maybe I'm argument. just, I've spent so much time at sort of the mid and high end at this point, I don't realize how desperate manufacturers are to keep uh, 
uh, I mean, to to keep prices the, down. The Intel 660P yeah. is probably our bet. It's probably my favorite budget performance drive. It's an NVMe drive, QLC, right. SLC cache. You know, in theory, if it ever ships, the one terabyte <laughs> version should be 200 bucks. Two terabytes right. should be four hundred dollars. You're getting down there to to lower prices, um, but four hundred dollars you can get a pretty big hard drive along with uh, you right. know two hundred and fifty gig SSD. So well, it, like a Western I, I Digital think Black, I think we're getting there, but I think we're still a little bit away. Yeah, I mean a Western Digital Black uh, fifty four hundred RPM ish, the standard one is like two hundred and two dollars. A four terabyte yeah. um, seventy two hundred RPM dive is two hundred twenty three dollars. You know, I you know the the number I'd love to see is what the average amount of storage the average user has on a hard drive. Um, I mean, just out of curiosity, do people? Well, say, I mean, does, yeah. does anybody other than me have? You know, I mean, I have a you know, I have. That's a, a good question. Uh, you know, I've, and, and I've what got I think a, is interesting is it's probably a difference between a laptop user and a desktop user. Mm-hmm. Desktop users tend to take their hard drives with them from machine to machine. Right. Doesn't really happen with laptops. Um. Yeah, I don't know. We keep it all on our phones. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm still trying to wrap my head around the idea of an eight gigabytes of memory on a cell phone. Because uh, I was looking at the one plus six pricing and I'm like, oh, they should put an SD card in there. Um, you know, but even the max, I think it's six hundred fifty dollars with two hundred fifty six gigabytes of storage on board and and eight gigabytes of RAM. So, you know, I'm I'm yeah. I, I just I, you know it's it's. You know, part of me wonders, you know, thinking, call, calling back to our first story of the show, is part of me wonders if NVIDIA pushed for ray tracing because if they can't get people to upgrade to higher resolution monitors, which would require a faster GPU, maybe they decided they had to do something so extraordinary, which is making the game look like the cutscenes or eliminating the cutscenes because the rendered video coming out of the game looks as good or better as anything they could pre-render uh, or ray trace uh, and, and drop in video format on the game. Maybe that was their plan to finally get people to upgrade their GPUs. We need something so amazing that even the people on 1080p monitors will finally upgrade, but I don't know. It's it's interesting to look at the configurations that are available, you know, in Costco or Best Buy, um, you know, or for that matter, if you're looking on Amazon and other places, um, because there's there's this kind of point where you know there's a hockey stick where it goes from super super inexpensive to all of a sudden everything is maxed out, and I I feel like you know I I, I feel that uh, I don't know I, I like the idea of these I like what they're doing. Um, you know, but but some of this stuff, like the performance increases, in some cases aren't nearly as impressive as I would like to be, or like them to be, or or much more frustrating. If, you know, or maybe it's a stepping stone. Like, okay, you know, yeah, it's great, it's got Optane or it's got Store MI, but what you really want to do is save up your money and upgrade to an SSD as soon as possible. Yeah. Uh, you know, stopgap, I guess, is the word that comes to mind. True. Not a stopgap. Samsung's portable SSD X5, one terabyte. Very simple. Alan says, quickest external. And I think if he had a full three, four, five hundred characters for that title, it would be Samsung portable SSD X5, one terabyte review. Quickest external drive I've ever gotten my grubby little paws on. Um, It looks like a cell phone because basically they're wrapping a whole lot of plastic around a 970 Evo. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, he he seemed, he's concerned about the size of it. I, I th- you know, like basically that the previous iterations of what Samsung has done on their external drives were smaller. Uh, right. We have another Thunderbolt 3 drive here that is smaller, made out of metal, more of a heat sink as opposed to, you know, keeping as much heat in as possible like plastic mm-hmm. tends to do. Um, yeah. But, yeah. I mean, having used a number of homebrew SSD enclosures and having used some, you know, some different, I mean, I'm still, I think at the moment, because I'm, I'm, I'm consolidating some drives, I think I have three uh, rotating media, you know, two and a half inch rotating media external drives in my bag, plus a 256 gigabyte in, or uh, NVMe drive that's in this sort of extruded aluminum container, which is fantastic for cooling and ab- absolute piece of stuff uh in terms of protecting the drive so 
you know, I, I would be very curious. Yeah. You know, I'm curious. You, you know, it's 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 uh, you know, it's not good that it limits. Uh, as somebody who routinely does multi gigabyte transfers, uh, it does concern me a little bit that the thermal design could be better on that one. Um, it kind of shocks me. Now, to be fair, mm -hmm. to be I mean, to be fair, Alan said he. I mean, we did. Alan, how many minutes of, of straight testing did you do on that drive without seeing throttling? More than five straight minutes of maxing out speed okay. on it, right? Okay. So, I mean, it, I think it's likely that something would happen eventually in terms of like right. slowing it down. But, you know, for an external drive that is not like in a data center use or something like that, like it's not to be able to write to it and read from it for five straight minutes at mm -hmm. the speeds that it's able to go. 2.8 gigs per second reads and 2.3 gigs per second writes is uh would be a lot of data uh, to to move <laughs> around to move around. Come but it is it is it is darn fast. Ones. Yeah, well that's true. Fast is good. There yeah, is I mean this would, this would be a good video editing drive while you're on the go, right? You're using a laptop yeah. and you have this, and yeah, that's I mean that's that's the perfect use case. For this product, there was I saw on the screen that that uh, you brought up the one area, the one complication is that it is a Thunderbolt three only device, mm. so it does not fall back right. to um, USB, right? Uh, which is disappointing uh, in terms of just you know having one device that maybe you could you know, have an adapter to make it a type A and you can move stuff from one laptop that didn't have Thunderbolt to one that did have Thunderbolt or, or vice versa. So it is, it is kind of limited by the current Thunderbolt three controller capabilities. Um, there is speculation. I think that we'll eventually have systems that will allow the, 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 the backwards compatibility to work, but we don't now. So it's kind of, you know, big deal. Like what's it matter type of thing. Um, mm -hmm. But performance is good. I mean, better than any external drive we've ever tested. If you look at that first, um, the first graph on that page, the Burst 128K sequential, this is, I mean, look, it's slower than the 970 Evo, but not by a huge amount, right? And it's, and it's significantly faster than the Samsung T5, which was the USB 3 device. Um, it's, it's damn fast. For, <laughs> for an external external unit, right? Like, yeah, it's impressive. There are worse it's things not cheap, than damn though. fast. No, speaking of not cheap, um, such an unusual picture. Pull up uh, 9 to 5 uh dropped a bunch of stories uh, today um, when we were recording this. Uh, first of all, uh, I'll kind of do these in reverse order, but leave, leave it right there because uh, Apple officially announced... Uh, the next event, September 12th, three new iPhones. Um, and quote, 9 to 5 Mac can exclusively share the first look at both new 5.8 inch and 6.5 inch OLED iPhones, which will be known to all that cower before them as the iPhone XS. Sigh. Which is like going to 11, right? Um, <laughs> the uh, the write-up... Uh, Guillermo Rambo has basically, he's very assertive. Other details are to be still to be determined, but we can report with certainty that iPhone XS will be the name. The OLED model will come in two sizes, including a larger version, and each will be offered in gold for the first time. Uh, and the other thing that is expected is the Apple Watch Series 4 reveal at the same media events. And, uh, you know, it's a watch, kids. It's an Apple Watch. So, massive display, dense watch face, and more. Um, they're saying like something like fifteen percent bigger. I think was the uh, the report that uh, Zach called it on Nine to Five Mac. Um, "Quote: Apple is rumored to be working on fifteen percent bigger displays for both sizes of Apple Watch. That rumor has been confirmed in the images we've discovered." And the quote. Uh, and a big part of that was reducing the bezel around the display, making that uh, smaller. And uh, eight complications around the time. So if you take a look at that, there's a lot of stuff going on in that face, right? There's the actual, um, if you can kind of drill in a little closer on that, there's four things in the middle. 
there's the actual hands that tell the time, and then in each of the four corners, there's additional information. So you've got a timer in the upper left, temperature in the upper right, um, sort of the the you know time till sunset in the lower right, and a UV index monitor in the lower left. So there is a yeah. lot of stuff going on there. Um, it is quite busy. <laughs> you know, well, it um, says I've got lunch with Ken at twelve. Oh, I missed that. <laughs> there you have it. Be very. Um, it's going to be very angry. I I'm very yeah I'm I'm super curious to uh, I'm super curious to see what the pricing on these is going to be. I'm really curious to see what the pricing on the Pixel Three is going to be. I'm really curious to see what the pricing on the XS, the next generation iPhone, is going to be. Um, you know, interesting, interesting, interesting. September twelfth. Uh, <laughs> Steve Jobs Theater in Cupertino. Gather round, people. Uh, I will not be invited unless something strange and wondrous happens. Uh, Ryan will not be invited. Uh, but if you're invited, nope. feel free to call in and let us know. So um, we'll see. Uh, but expect phones, expect watches, or a watch, uh, the Watch 4. Um, man. <laughs> I just, it, Remember Intel? Intel makes processors. Um, they've been trickling keep out processors. That. I keep hearing that. Uh, so, so uh, you know, a bunch of announcements out of uh, IFA in Berlin. Um, a couple of the big ones uh, happened a couple of days ago. Um, yeah, Intel announced it. I, I don't know why I'm feeling so somber while I'm doing this. Uh, Intel uh, announced... Uh, their next generation uh, five watt Amber Lake Y and 50 watt Whiskey Lake U parts. Um, you know, basically the latest uh, processors for thin and light notebooks and two in one devices. The 8565 U, aka Whiskey Lake, 14 nanometer process, four cores, eight threads, consuming a tidy 15 watts. And uh, what's really crazy is uh, they've also got the Copy Lake refresh. Um, well, actually, I guess the Core i5-8265U and the Core i3-8415U. Um, I do love that the Core i5 and the Core i7 are running uh, uh, four cores, eight threads. And uh, the Amber Lake Y processors, um, two cores, four threads, five watts, uh, two cores, four threads. And it's funny, 1.5 gigahertz and 4.2 gigahertz on on that top of the line core i7 8500Y. Uh, 1.4 yeah. gigahertz, uh, 3.9 gigahertz uh, turbo clock on that uh, that five watt core i5 8200Y and the core M3 8100Y, two, two cores, four threads again, um, 2.1 gigahertz uh, and 3.9 gigahertz for the base clock and the... Uh, Max turbo clock. And, you know, if you're like me, you may sort of look at the weight. The 8100 Roi Core M3 is running at 2.1 gigahertz, and the Core i5 is running at 1.4 gigahertz. Uh, but stop, because remember, um, speed does not necessarily equate to individual core performance processors, but mm -hmm. uh, some big frequency bumps. Um, you know, these are... I, these are nice parts. Boy, it'd be neat to see what Intel could do if they could get from a 14 nanometer process down to 10. Yeah. <laughs> uh, One other thing that came out uh, today that wasn't in this story is that Whiskey Lake has is actually a slightly different architecture. And because it has hardware mitigations for two Spectre variants two different Spectre variants, um, but not the Spectre variant 2 uh, vulnerability, which is the one that the mitigation has the most impact on performance. So right. this has some stuff, but not not anything that's going to make a big performance difference uh, in that in that way. Amber Lake has none of those in there. It's basically a bend version of the, of the previous generation architecture. Um, so that was kind of new coming out there, but it's interesting, you know, that there's that there's any hardware change in there at all. I think is 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 a good sign, and they've indicated that uh, Cascade Lake, which will be the next server architecture coming out, uh, I think later this year, will um, will have will have a further development of those hardware mitigations for <laughs> Spectre Meltdown as well. So we'll see oh how that goodness. how that turns out. 
Yeah, it's it's been interesting because there's also been so many dis, you know there's there's been consumer electronics and speakers and all sorts of stuff coming out of IFA this week. Um, uh, Lenovo did their Tech Life event uh, earlier today, maybe like a two hours ago. Hopefully, I'm doing the math right, and Lenovo's lawyers aren't going to drop out of the ceilings with a black bag and a gag order. Um, but uh, the Yoga C930, which is Lenovo's uh, new flagship two-in-one laptop, uh, is coming out. Um, which is actually uh, uh, using e-ink. So it has a regular display and an, uh, an e-ink screen that's a customizable keyboard. Uh, the ThinkPad X1 Extreme, which I got to see uh, under NDA earlier this year, um, you know, it's pretty crazy. Gigabit Wi-Fi, Core i9. Um, they're claiming uh, the rapid charge technology built into it will uh, charge the battery up to 80% in just 60 minutes. Um, 4K, 100% Adobe RGB screen, um, Dolby Vision HDR, HDR support. Um, you know, it's uh, it's some pretty cool stuff. And if you're the kind of person, or if your kids are the kind of person that really want to be Kylo Ren when they grow up, uh, one, you have my sympathies, <laughs> uh, and two, uh, their Star Wars Jedi challenges is, is getting a, a dark side expansion, so you can be Kylo Ren and duel Yoda or Rey. Or more, <laughs> so that's the, you know, the AR system with the lightsaber uh, that comes out. So, uh, bunch of announcements, much more, uh, more affordable uh, laptops on that list too, um, including uh, um, they've got a uh, Chromebook, the C30, which looks really good. Uh, the Yoga Chromebook, which looks really outrageous because it's a Chromebook. Uh, available with a max of a 4K monitor, uh, you know, an edgeless kind of bezel-less screen, um, DDR4 memory, a decent amount of SSD storage, and they're claiming up to 10 hours of battery life off an 8th gen uh, Intel Core processor. So some good stuff coming out of IFA on the computing side of things, should you like uh, computers uh, and, and want to have a faster computer <laughs> in, sometime in the near future. Um, but yeah, it's... it's uh, Oh, it's amazing to sort of realize just exactly how much stuff comes out in EVA, uh, including uh, there's a new uh, Dell XPS developer edition, um, which is their 13-inch, uh, 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 their 13-inch, well, it's a Dell XPS 13, but it's essentially running Ubuntu 18.04, um, which is really, really nice, especially if, if you deal on the security side of things to actually have a Linux laptop. Um you know, they've got, uh, I think, a processor update on the 13-inch 2-in-1, and uh, the Vostro line is back. And uh, the Vostro 14 5000 and 15 5000, um, 8th gen processors, USB-C port for data and power, but they also have a tremendous number of ports on those. So if, if you're in a situation where, you know, you have... 300 offices that all have VGA inputs on the projectors, they've got you covered to a certain point on that one. Uh, but I just love the fact that they had a full-sized, uh, along with USB-C, they had a full-size HDMI out, and they had full-size USB ports on it. Um, that was pretty good. I was definitely, definitely, definitely uh, delighted to see that. And the Vostro stuff, like it's it's a little bit thicker than the XPS, obviously. That's how they have the room for all those ports on the side. But the build quality on that um, looked pretty solid. And I want to say it was starting at like 579 for the entry-level models, um, which looks really, really good. The 5581, I think that's called. So, um Good stuff. And uh, actually also a redesign of the Inspiron 7000 and 5000. Uh, and they're doing a, a premium consumer Chromebook, um, like a 14-inch Chromebook 2-in-1. And, uh, you know, not the hugest specs on that, but again, it's a Chromebook. You don't need a ton of processing for most stuff. You do uh, Core i3, 8130 CPU. And uh, they're doing storage on EMMC, so like 128 gigabytes of storage in EMMC max. And part of me would rather have an SSD, but again, part of me is like, this is a Chromebook. You're supposed to store everything in the cloud anyway. Um, do with that as you want. But uh, something uh, something to think about. Lots of nice laptops coming out in the next six or eight weeks if you're shopping for a new laptop. So, the uh, What was the yep. entry level? The, the least expensive XPS 13, what was the entry level price on that one? Um, I don't know. Oh goodness! I swear it was in Ken wrote it up. Um, there it is. Uh, the XP thirteen two and one. That's nine ninety nine. Where did it go? Eight hundred ninety nine dollars. Um, 
for the, uh, I want to say that's, yeah, that's, it's funny. I was just complimenting uh, Dell and Lenovo in some meetings of how they didn't have any entry. They didn't have any four gigabyte configurations. Uh, Whoops. And it looks like Dell just announced <laughs> a four gigabyte version of the XPS 13 to get the price down to $899.99. Um, which is tempting, but I highly recommend if you plan on using this laptop for anything other than occasionally browsing the web and the very smallest of, of Excel spreadsheets that you take a look at the uh, $1,100 version with the Core i5, uh, 8250U, and 8 gigabytes of RAM. Um, oh. <laughs> I just want RAM to be cheaper. Um, so... One of the running conversations was like, Global Foundries beat Intel to 7 nanometer. Everybody's kind of beating Intel to, to 10 nanometer. Uh, you have, uh, I guess Jeremy wrote this one up, but I'll let you talk about, uh, uh, <laughs> did, did they not get 7 nanometer to work at, at Global Foundry? What's going on with that? They did not. Uh, they announced this week that um, they were indefinitely suspending development of 7 nanometer process technologies, uh, which basically means canceling the node. Um, and instead, they're going to focus on their current process technologies, 12 nanometer, 14 nanometer, and larger, 28 nanometer, 20 nanometer uh, auxiliary technologies like FDSOI or um, 22... FPX, F FD FDX, uh, basically, <clears throat> they they no longer want to be a leading edge foundry, somebody that is spending the billions of dollars of R and D to get to seven nanometer, to get to five nanometer and beyond. Um, the reasoning for that is probably a couple. One, keep in mind that they're a much smaller fab than somebody like TSMC or Intel, for that matter. Uh, I think they represent maybe nine percent of the market they're second or third place but they represent only like nine percent of the market and they only had apparently they only had two customers that were really lining up to to do seven enemy with them one of them was amd and one of them was ibm who they bought these fabs from or, or several of these fabs from originally so the <clears throat> it basically came down to did they feel like they were going to make money on this if they kept pushing forward and the answer was no and mm -hmm. so now we have you know, you have TSMC, who is the furthest along on 7 nanometer by a significant margin. And then you have Samsung, who is coming up behind them. And then you'll have Intel getting their 10 nanometer stuff straight anytime now, probably, maybe. <laughs> and that's kind of it for the leading edge guys, right? The people that are pushing right. foundry technology as hard as they can. Global Foundries will still, they'll still, I think they'll actually be a more successful company now because they'll, they can retool a little bit, re rearrange their fab facilities in a way to target these customers that are not on the bleeding edge. And and one of the things that you know we and I, I'm as guilty of this as anybody we tend to forget is that not everybody is is pushing for seven nanometer parts or ten right. nanometer parts. They're quite happy with what they have in terms of cost efficiency and yield, and maybe they actually want to use um, customized materials, unique materials that. Uh, are better suited to larger larger gates and pitches and stuff. So it, it actually makes sense for them to be on 28, you know, 65, even 90 nanometer production. That's why companies like Skywater, which is another foundry based in Minneapolis, exist, right? They do specialized custom stuff, a lot of work with the U.S. government, et cetera. Um, but this was also kind of interesting for was AMD, right? So AMD's stock's been on a roll and they're very uh, sensitive to anything that might disrupt that. And, you know, they were they were out there talking with media about, hey, look, uh, you know, Global Foundries are going to say this. Uh, we want to make sure that you have our story on here. The, it, it's not a coincidence that over the last couple of months, AMD let it slip that the first 7 nanometer Vega GPU was coming from TSMC or that the first... Zen 2 Roam CPUs were going to come from TSMC. They've taped out those parts at TSMC. They had not taped out any parts at Global Foundries yet. They were working on it, but they hadn't, they hadn't done it. So they're basically saying, look, we, we knew TSMC was going to be first. We were going to lean on them for the majority of the production anyway. This doesn't affect our roadmap. It doesn't affect our time to market. It doesn't affect customers, pricing, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and 
that they're that they were still planning on going full full steam ahead. So, um, I and I and I think that's probably true. I think all that all that makes sense. And if anything, you could also see it being an advantage for AMD. They don't have to split their engineering team between two different foundry groups. You know, when, when you're doing that, you spend a lot of time customizing your design and getting it prepped for that specific node, that specific foundry. You know, seven nanometer at TSMC was going to be different than what was at Global Foundries is going to be different than what's at Samsung. So they can they can now just maybe be a little bit more focused in that regard. Now they know where all their GPUs are going to be made. They know where all their CPUs are going to be made. It's not a question anymore, uh, and it's not a competing it's a competition thing. So a little bit of a of a downer. I mean, it was only it was as recently as February. I was out at Global Foundries in Malta at that fab, seeing their seven nanometer lines coming online, seeing the EU EUV machines, the um, uh, UV. Uh, 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 devices that they were that, that that they had installed, right? And they were built. They were installing a second one, and these are the most advanced, most expensive units that you can get. So, um, th this wasn't something that's that has been known for the last year, and they were just you know waiting to tell everybody for an opportune time. This was clearly a leadership change at the top, direction change in the middle, and this is where we're at. So, exciting, if nothing else. <laughs> <laughs> Exciting, if nothing else. That's pretty much the summary on that one. That's a big change. Uh, Azul Inspire Fanless Copy Lake Barebone Mini PC Review. Um, every few weeks, it seems like you turn around and there's a, another intriguing uh, bare bones or, or mini PC. Um, fanless, 32 gigabytes of DDR4 max, if you can find a, a pair of 16 gigabyte SODMs. Um, two and a half inch SATA support and M.2 support, which means it's already probably in some ways more useful than, than some of the more expensive um, fanless uh, uh, Intel devices out there. Um, pretty big range in price, right? Apollo Lake, i.e. very, very little power, uh, $170. Core i3, $270. Core i5, $335. Uh, and depending on what you're doing, I think the sweet spot in this is going to be somewhere between that uh, Core i3 and Core i5 and a Core i7 for $449.99. Um, Sebastian did the write-up on this one. Was, uh, was he fairly impressed with this one? Or, I mean, it, it seems yeah, like I think it's so. fairly... Well loaded. I mean, it's got DisplayPort, it's got HDMI, and it's got VGA, uh, Ethernet, Wi-Fi built in, USB 3.1. Um, it actually looks like a well thought out fanless design. Although I, I probably wouldn't mind some more uh, uh, some more holes in various places for more airflow. But uh, that's like right. battery life. I always want more. Um, looks like fairly, you know, surprisingly easy to configure when you look at the, yeah. the way they did the uh, slot for the SSD drive on that one. Uh, you know, there's probably more screws than you probably dealt with for a while, but at least it doesn't look like it'll be emotionally traumatizing to get uh, to get in and out. Um, uh, you know, a little bit slower than the Leva Z in his benchmark. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, a little bit faster than the older Azul Byte 3 with a Celeron N3450. So it, pretty much where it, it, it needs to be, I would say, to state the obvious. Um, yeah, and it, and it's priced it's priced aggressively too. It's three hundred twenty five dollars for yeah. this model, the Core i five. Obviously, it's bare bones. You got to add your own memory. You got to add your own storage. But after that, you're pretty much done. Right. Uh, you know, put in eight gigs of memory and a either a two and a half inch a SATA SSD or uh, an NVMe SSD. You know, two hundred fifty gig drive or something like that, and you're and you're kind of good to go. Um, which is significantly less, or at least a good mm -hmm. good deal less than um, than the actual Intel Nooks themselves. Right. So, yeah, and uh, you know, a lot of people have these have a lot of good uses for these these small form factor devices. I will point out that's not a VGA port, as you mentioned; it's a serial port. Oh. <laughs> so, yeah, oh. yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's hey, everybody! Go. Every once in a while, somebody's got to have that stuff still. Well, you know, if you <laughs> if you have a live, it was funny. Somebody's like, "Why do they still have this?" And I was like, "Well, imagine if you have you know several." Hundreds. Of, let's say you got thirty million dollars in production equipment and a perfectly well-functioning production line, but you can no longer buy computers that can attach to the one connection available for your giant, incredibly expensive uh, uh, machine. Yep. So now you know yep. there are options out there. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm not even going to touch this one. Quote: Acer shows weird stuff at IFA in Berlin. 
Yeah, this this is a quick one. And <laughs> most of the stuff here is fine. It's laptops, blah, 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 whatever. Right. Uh, the things that I thought are interesting is, is that, first of all, they released a monitor with a hood on it, right? Always a plus. Yeah, I, I guess. It just... I. I think that's I think that's cool. I think I would want that. Um, but it, you know, they got another monitor, the FreeSync monitor, GSync monitor. Yep, they got laptops with Cabby Lake G. Fantastic, great uh, stuff. They got a VR headset. Blah blah blah. Look at this thing all the way at the end. This thing called the Thronos. You'll you'll know it when you see it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the Thronos. This is a this is a device that I wish they would sell. It'll never actually come to market. That's my statement. I'm sticking with it. Um, it is a gaming chair on a pedestal with uh, a I don't know what you would call that thing that goes over over top of your head there, um, a like hood? a like a yeah, a like a bar? hood, a decorated <laughs> a decorative hood that then holds three displays, three wide curved displays on this guy. It's uh, it's pretty impressive. The lights look good. Yeah. It's a, uh, hopefully they're RGB, right? So you can get all that. I, I, I just, I think this would be really cool to have, but I think it would be, you know, ten thousand dollars, and we'll never ship ever. But they made they made a, at least a rendering of it, if nothing else. Would you buy a Thronos? <laughs> what you don't buy renders? You you you. <laughs> Well, you know, sometimes I guess. Sometimes. Is that what Kickstarter's for? I was going to say, it's generally only on Kickstarter. Um, <laughs> you know, I you look, it wouldn't be the first time we've seen a, a, a massive manufacturer float something out uh, or show up at CES or, or some other event with something that kind of worked uh, just to see if anybody would get excited enough to try to buy it on the show floor. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, you know... What's the worldwide market for that? Several. <laughs> it would, it would, be, it would be better if it was like sort of an egg that had 15 monitors edge to edge right. for a virtual That's gaming true. environment that didn't exist yet. That would be yeah. just a little more off. Um, <laughs> yeah, I can't imagine what that would cost. Also, do you fold open the arm to get in the side or is does it fold down at the back so you can walk inside? I want to know how you actually get know. into that thing. I don't know. You slide up we from the wait. bottom. Bated breath. <laughs> what a week. So Global Foundries quit 7 nanometer. Intel's got some more process, 14 nanometer. iPhone XS is the name we hear of the next generation iPhone. There's more information than you can shake several sticks at on the watch for. Tons of new laptops from Dell and Lenovo. Some eighth generation mobile processors that neither Ryan and I seem to be particularly excited about, and a stopgap technology that may not be necessary by the time it really picks up volume in the marketplace uh, from AMD mm. and Intel. Oh. But there was a really fast external SSD drive from Samsung. <laughs> it's an odd week this week. <laughs> And you could kind of almost use the less expensive FreeSync monitors with NVIDIA GPUs, at least until uh, somebody shuts that down in the drivers, which probably, but not necessarily, will be NVIDIA. Yep. So, yeah, there you have it, people. This week in computer hardware is a weekly show brought to you by Twit TV. Twit.tv slash Twitch is the place to find the information on how to download it, how to get all of our older episodes. That's Ryan on the left. That's me on the right. Uh, I'm not wearing a hat because my hair was recently shorn, which is why I'm wearing a hat right now. We uh, do the show each and every week. You may have noticed we talk a lot about hardware and occasionally about dogs, but mostly about hardware. And we enjoy uh, we enjoy you being here. We invite you to join us each and every week at uh, twit.tv slash twitch, or better yet, get the RSS link or search for it in your favorite podcatcher for uh, Twitch, T-W-I-C-H, or This Week in Computer Hardware. If you've enjoyed the sonic stylings and analysis available from Mr. Ryan and Shroud, his sonorous voice and excellent writing can be found at pcper.com. Mm. Uh, which is a fine place to get your hardware reviews if you're looking for just about anything to make your PC, your mobile life faster. It is a good place to get lots of useful information. You can find me at techthing.com, T-E-K-T-H-I-N-G.com. It's a weekly show I do with the lovely Shannon Morris. And uh, yes, Shannon was at Germany uh, and she had things to say. She had feels 
about ray tracing and playing video games on the new NVIDIA RTX. And uh, she had less enthusiastic feels about Android Pie, but I'm going to send you in the general direction of uh, techthing.com to find out more about that. Uh, I'll be at Cedia next week, so I'm, I'm pretty excited about that. The, the, it's, it's a consumer electronics uh, CES kind of thing, uh, which is aimed at installers, uh, people who install high-end, um, uh, you know, home uh, theater and home automation, and it's pretty crazy because it's a mixture of like people who provide tools or the trucks that installers travel in, all the way up through Samsung and LG and B and W, Kef, other speaker manufacturers. Sonos is going to be there answering questions about the Sonos amp and some of the other things that they're working on. So I'm pretty excited about that one. We'll talk more about that probably week after next because i will be on the show floor after having seen the show for approximately an hour uh when we launch the show next week huh. but i will keep you posted um if you're thinking about uh home theater gear or audio gear do me a favor uh, check out avxl.com that's the podcast i host with robert heron and tweet at ryan shroud or at patrick norton and we will do our best to fit your questions into the show by the way you can ask us questions about other hardware things ssds gpus ryan likes gpus processors system builds mobile devices phones occasionally consoles but you should point most of your console questions at ryan unless it's a switch question in which case i'll ask shannon for you because she is bolted <laughs> to her switch uh, especially when she is traveling with that, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for listening or watching the video. I'm Patrick Norton. I'm Ryan Schrapp. Catch you next week on Twitch.